Read verse number 26, Exodus chapter 32, verse number 26, and I'm excited about tonight. Uh, uh, you might uh, uh, take your, take your, uh, you can, it's just home folk here tonight, so take, take the suit jacket off, pull, pull your shoes off, whatever you got to do, get comfortable, but not too comfortable, because it's going to be good, amen. Exodus chapter 32, verse 26, let's all stand. In honor of the word of God, we're going to read one verse real quick. Exodus chapter 32, verse number 26, the Bible says, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for the day that you've given to us. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we, we get to be in the house of God, to get to hear the word of God preached. Ask Heavenly Father, Lord, that you'd use me tonight. Holy Spirit, make me a vessel fit for the Master's use and that you would use me and fill me, forgive me for where I failed you, and I just ask Heavenly Father that you would uh, speak to us tonight through the message. Thank you that we get to gather here together as a church and hear the word of God. And As Brother West said this morning, Lord, we get to do it freely, not in fear, but Lord, we can come and hear and just ask Holy Spirit that you'd meet with us tonight. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Exodus chapter 31, we're going to go back to verse number 18. Our story begins here. Uh, of Moses, and if you're not familiar with this portion of Scripture, Moses is on top of the mount, and uh, he is getting the Ten Commandments from God, and he's been up here for several days now, uh, and more actually more than several days, been up here uh, for a while. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us an exact time uh, how long he's up here, but uh, verse 18, the Bible says, and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. You see, Moses has been up here for a while, and he's been talking to God. He's been getting a hold of God, and God's been talking to him. God has shown himself to Moses, and uh, Moses is uh, giving, giving some instructions from God, and he gets the Ten Commandments from God here on top of the mount. And he, uh, the Bible says after God had made an end of communing with him, after they had done talking together, and, and, uh, and God was done with Moses, they... He gave him the two tables of testimony, the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his own finger. But then you go to verse 32, we turn to where we have a tragic turn of events. It says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. See, the, the uh, children of Israel got impatient. They don't know what Moses is doing. He's been gone longer than probably what they expected. They've just been sitting there. And they've got their eyes on the wrong thing. You see, they said, uh, for, as, for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Moses didn't bring them out of the land of Egypt. God brought them out of the land of Egypt. But they had their focus on a man. Moses was gone. The man of God's gone. So what do the mice do when the cat's not around? They play. So the children of Israel thought, well, we can get away with it. We can go back into the sin that we had in Egypt. Moses, the man of God, he's not coming back. They don't know, we don't know what's become of him. Amen. In our lives and in our service as a Christian, we ought to serve God not because of a man, but we ought to serve God because we serve a living God. Moses, the man of God, our pastor is not responsible for our home in heaven is not responsible for giving us eternal life. It's Jesus that we serve that's, got, that's brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Moses didn't bring the children of Israel. He was merely the instrument that God used. And in your life, you re recognize that God is the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Jesus has saved your soul. And when you serve God, you serve Him till the day you die because it's Jesus that you serve. Then verse 2, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool. And he made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. What a sad turn. Where the children of Israel go from serving an almighty God to serving a golden calf, which has 
eye, which, has, which has eyes but cannot see, ears that cannot hear, and a mouth that cannot speak. But yet they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Boy, what a, what a step backwards for the children of Israel. And Aaron the priest. Aaron, supposed to be standing in the place for God, supposed to be a man of God, gives in to the people. Boy, that's what the problem with men of God today in America. Men of God too, too much kowtow to the people when people say, well, we don't want to have to do that. We want our own gods. And men of God kowtow down and let them be, and, let, and give them what they want and tickle the ears of the people that sit in the pew. But once again, do we need men of God and people of God that decide to serve God? Because they love him. Boy, I get frustrated with Aaron. As a man of God, I get frustrated that he let the people backslide so quickly that he didn't even put up a fight, that he even made the God with his own two hands. How dare a man of God do that? How dare a man of God turn people away from serving Almighty God Jehovah and let them serve a golden calf? I'll be dead before I let somebody come through our church or somebody come through my youth department that I kowtow and let them tell me what I preach or let them tell me what I say because there's a living God that I have to answer to. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, verse 7, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. God knew everything that was going on. God saw what they were doing and God was displeased. And notice verse 8, a sad story for their character. God says they've turned aside quickly. Didn't take them very long. Didn't take them long to get doubtful. Didn't take them long to take their faith off and their eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ and turn it on to something that meant nothing in their life. Sad it is when God looks down in our lives and we turn aside quickly out of the way. When we turn aside quickly away from what God has given to us, away from the Word of God, away from the church of God. And God says they turned aside quickly and He watched them as they made a molten image. And God knew everything that they had done. And the Lord said unto Moses in verse 9, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. God was going to kill everybody off. God said, I'm sick and tired of it. I've done everything for them. God said, I'm just going to take them and wipe them out and I'm going to start over with you, Moses. God gets tired of stiff necks. Boy, it's time people of God stop having a stiff neck to God. Boy, it's time us men of God stop having a stiff neck and let God humble us and let God use us for the master service. But we as Christians so quickly get stiff necks to God. Verse 11, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out? to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Was it that God was the evil here talking about sin? No, God forbid. God is a just God and he's a perfect God. But what it was is God was going to take their lives and God was going to destroy them from the face of the earth. And Moses talked God out of it. Moses got a hold of God and he said, God, don't do this. God, don't think about it. And it's funny how that there was a conversation between him and God. And God said, fine, Moses, for you I won't do it. And Moses turned and went down from the mount and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Let me give you a tip here. How do you know when someone is backsliding? Number one, they turn away from God. 
The children of Israel turned away from God. They stopped uh, serving God. They took everything that they had learned about God, threw it down the tubes, and served a molten calf. Number two, they worshipped something else. In a Christian's life, you can always tell when somebody's backsliding because they turn away from God, turn away from His church, and they begin to worship something else. Many Christians today are at a football game or watching the Super Bowl. You know why? Because they don't worship God. They worship a pigskin thrown across the field. They worship their car in the garage. They worship the house they live in. They worship the money that they make. It's because they're backslidden. Get your eyes on Jesus today, America. Get your eyes on Jesus today and realize there's a greater call in your life. Number three, their music changes. Look at verse number, look at that verse we talked about. Mo, Joshua says to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp in verse 18, or verse 17. Verse 18, Moses recognized that noise. He knew it wasn't a noise of war. He knew it was a noise of what he heard in Egypt. See, Joshua didn't recognize it. Moses knew where that noise was coming from. Mo Moses recognized it because it's that wicked music of the world that doesn't make sense. It's the music of the world that doesn't have the, the songs of God to it. It's the music of the world that sounds like war, that sounds like strife, that sounds like contention, that sounds like somebody's being killed. Moses said it's not the noise of war, it's them that sing. Boy, when you get backslidden, your music changes. You'll watch as you go back and you begin to see a decline in the music that you listen to. You no longer do you find joy in amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But no, you've got to turn to the music of the world, to the Nickelback, to the Led Zeppelins, to those, to the Ozzy Osbournes, to those that sing, and, and you get more joy out of that. Boy, it's sad in America. We see even our Baptist churches that let a rock concert go on in the church. It's a rock concert with a country music feel, with a jazz hip twist, and they're still singing the blues. Sad in America when our churches have turned into an entertainment center. But you know why? It's because we're backslidden in America. We've let our music go down the tubes because we're not worshiping God, we're worshiping ourselves. Our music sounds more and more like the world. It sounds more and more more and more like those singers we used to listen to when we got saved. Boy, God's called us out of some called us to something greater. God's called us to and can it be that I uh, in, in, in all of, in, in, uh, in the old rugged cross and there's power in the blood. There's better music out there, amen. But Moses knew what was going on. Verse 19, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf. And the dancing. That's how you know music's of the world. Makes you want to hip. Makes you want to do the dish rag twist. Makes you want to do the skunk skedaddle. Makes you want to raise one leg and tap with the arm. There was dancing in the camp. You know music's of God when it puts you to your knees. And it makes you realize who God is. And how great He is. And how worse of a sinner you are. And how much you don't deserve God. But how great that God's mercy is. Not a dancing that uplifts the body. Not dancing that makes you, that looks sensual. But in an average American church, average Baptist church, sad to say, people are rolling down the aisles. People are dancing down the aisles. All in the name of being filled with the Spirit. But look at Moses. That's how you know a man of God. And Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the table out of his hands. And he breaked them beneath the mount. Boy, you know he's a man of God. He saw the sin. He saw the filth. He saw everything that he had thrown behind because he knew it wasn't worth it. Because he knew it was sin. Got angry. Threw it down. Broke everything in his hand. And he got mad and said, what on earth are you doing? And he took the calf which they had made and he burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. Boy, you know that man of God was mad. Boy, he took everything that they had made, put it into powder, put it into water, and said, drink it if it's so good. Drink of it if it can heal you, if you think that it can do something better for you. Get it, get it in your system. 
Moses said to Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Backsliding's a sin. It's still a sin in America. It's still a sin in today's churches. And it's still a sin in the sight of God. When you backslide, go backwards and don't move forward for God. And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Talk like Joel Osteen. Don't get mad at me. Thou knowest the people. Boy, he starts blaming people. Starts blaming everybody else. Says that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. <laughs> he said, I don't know what happened. I just took what they had, and, 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 and this calf came out. Boy, ain't that the average Christian. I don't know what happened, Pastor. I, I was just, it, it just happened. I don't know how. Aaron cracks me up, trying to lie. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, this is the last step of backsliding right here, when you know you take the clothes off instead of putting the clothes on, when you become immodest in the sight of God, the music of the world, the things that you worship, all of those things will drive you to become less and less modest. They always drive you to draw attention to the body. That's why... When you go and you hear of rock concerts, they never end up in modesty. Had some gentlemen that were at my work, and I use gentlemen loosely. Had these fellows, not friends, fellows. They began to talk about the wickedness they'd been involved in, the rock concerts that they had been to. And I had to walk away because of the filth that went on. Because of the junk they began to discuss. But you know why? The closer you get to the music of the world and what the world worships is the closer you get to sin. You stay away from it. You walk away. You don't let that be an influence in your family. You don't let that be an influence in your children because you'll watch as your children decline and they'll get loose in their dress. That's why in America, the women walk down the sidewalk and you have to turn your head the other way. When you turn your head the other way, you see a billboard. Then you got to look straight in front of you. You look straight in front of you, and you see somebody else in a car. By the time you're done, you're not even looking at the road. You're looking at your feet. And then your wife says, watch out. You're going to hit somebody. You know why? Because America's backslidden away from God. Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame. Still ashamed to be naked. Still ashamed to show the body. God says it's still a shame to show what God intended to be covered. America, it's still a shame. Those cheerleaders at the sports program today, that's a shame. It's shameful in the sight of God. Ought not to be watched. Ought not to be seen. They ought to cover up. They ought to get in church. But no, America's bent on nakedness in this world. God forbid. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. Boy, tonight there's two teams gathered to throw a pigskin across the field, and everybody's taking sides. You're either on one team or you're on the other. You're either for one team or you're for the other. Well, right now, while the, while the world is divided amongst two teams that everybody's attention is drawn to, can I be like Moses? And stand in the gate and cry that there's another team. And ask who's on God's side tonight? Who's on God's team tonight? Hang the Broncos. Hang the Panthers. Who's on God's team tonight? Who's not going to let America go down the tubes and watch a pigskin thrown across the field and watch everything that our forefathers have worked so hard for to bring this nation to what she is? No, I'm tired of letting that happen. I'm going to stand up tonight in the gate 
and I'm going to cry. Who's on God's side tonight? Who's not going to let the sin reign? Who's not going to let the sin be among their families and among themselves and among their generation? Who's going to make a stand tonight to be on God's team and let God be the one that rules? Amen. Boy, I'd like to ask you a question tonight. Are you on God's team? Are you for God tonight? Are you with God tonight? Half the world is gathered to watch two teams play. A bunch of perverts out there on the field that have been committing adultery and fornication, but everybody covers that up because they make lots of money because the root of mo- or the love of money is the root of all evil. But I'd like to cry tonight that there are churches that are empty in their pews that could be full, but there's because America's backslidden. And sad to say, it's our Baptist churches. I read an article today. I read one that said the churches have their Super Bowl parties. They shut down church. But the Super Bowl wants to shut them down from being able to do that because they're selling tickets to be in the, to watch the game. The Super Bowl wants to shut that down because they're making money that they can't. Sad in America's churches when we'd rather watch the Super Bowl than to hear the Word of God preached. Are you on God's side tonight? Are you on God's team? Can I give you a couple things that we need to be on God's team about? Moses cried, who's on the Lord's side? We need to be on God's side about a few things in America. Anymore, there's a fight. Anymore, we've got to roll our sleeves up. And we've got to get ready. Because there's a fight in America for the truths and the doctrines of God. Can I ask you tonight, is there anybody on God's team about salvation? So many churches... So many people, so many pastors are leaving the doctrine of the gospel of Christ and telling you can be saved through baptism, telling you you can be saved through church membership, telling you 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 can have a bloodless salvation. But can I remind you tonight that Jesus is the only way to heaven and redemption is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood that cleanses within. Time we stand up and proclaim the gospel, preach the name of Jesus, and say we're on God's side tonight about Jesus and about salvation. Don't let those churches around Wichita let you kowtow and say, well, with, there's another way to heaven. Well, there's another way that you can get there. You don't have to go through the cross. You don't have to go through the blood. And I say, hogwash, you're going to split hell wide open because there's only one way to the Father. Time we stop giving in and letting the devil gain ground and letting the devil get some ground on us in the field. But time we get on the offense, grab that ball, so to speak, and get on the offense for God about the gospel. I mean, you say, well, I'm on God's team tonight. I'm on God's team about salvation. I'm born again. I believe that. Have you told anybody about it then? If you're on God's team tonight, when's the last time you handed out a gospel tract? When's the last time you told somebody about the blood of Jesus that can save from sin, that can give you joy and hope within? If you're on God's team tonight, if you hear the cry of Moses, stand upon the mount and say, who's on God's side? Then time we get out in the highways and the hedges and on the streets and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Time we quit waiting around for everybody else to do our job. And Christians, get a burden. Get a burden about lost souls. Boy, we're quick to uh, mention everything else. But when it's time to go soul winning, we, we shy away. I know I've done it. I know I've been guilty when God wanted me to go tell a lost sinner. And I told God I didn't have time. I told God I didn't want to go. And then I got on my knees later and I said, God, I'm sorry. God reminded me we ought to give more time to spreading the gospel. Thursday night's not too much to ask. At our church we have soul winning. Thursday night at 6.30, it's not too much to ask to go out and preach the gospel. It's not too much to ask to go out on a Saturday and visit my bus route. It's not too much to ask of God to go visit the boys and girls and bring them to church and allow them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Time we get on God's side about salvation. Time we get on God's team about standards. Boy, everybody's leaving, aren't they? We're watching the independent Baptist churches turn into the Methodists and the Lutherans and our standards. We're going to Joel Osteen mentality and serving God. 
that we can do whatever we want and it'll be okay. Can I remind you tonight that every Christian is called to a standard of holiness that God expects? Moses saw the nakedness of God's people and said, No, that's not what God wanted. No, that's not how you ought to dress. No, that's not how you ought to look. He said, Who's on God's side tonight? If they were going to be on God's side, they had to put their clothes back on because Moses wasn't going to let them over there naked. God still wants men to look like men. God still wants the women to look like women. He still wants us to dress modestly. He still wants the men to lead the home. He still wants the church to not be a rock concert. He still wants the church to be old-fashioned, fundamental in their standards, in their beliefs, in their doctrines. Who's on God's team tonight? Can I lift up a cry to America? Can I lift up a cry to the churches that everybody's leaving the doctrine, leaving holiness in our lives? We give God an excuse for what we watch on TV. Say, well, it's okay, God. When we know that if God sat with us, we couldn't turn it on. Well, it's okay, God. It's just a little bit of nudity. It's just a little bit. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Somebody on God's side tonight? God's looking. God's drawn a line in the sand. God's angry tonight with America. God's angry tonight with the sin. And God needs some Moseses to stand in the gap and say, God, it's okay. We'll be the light. God wants somebody on His side. That's not going to let the vile words. That's not going to let the cuss, the cussing. That's not going to let the crude and the nude on their television and watched in front of their children. God wants somebody that's going to be on His side tonight. Could God come into your home? Would God be okay? Could God sit on your couch? God wants us tonight to live for Him. Anybody on God's side tonight? There's a call. America's gathered tonight, worshiping an idol. God wants to know if somebody's with Him. Anybody on God's side tonight, number three, about old-fashioned soul winning? God still wants old-fashioned door knocking, gospel preaching, soul winners in His churches. God still wants somebody not afraid to get on the streets and not afraid to pull the car over and hand out a gospel track to the lost soul walking down the road. God still wants somebody tonight that's not afraid to get out and ask the question, if you die today, do you know you'd go to heaven? God wants somebody tonight to be on His side that's, not re or that's ready to preach the gospel on the streets as well as in the church. God wants the pastors tonight in America to get on the streets and out from behind the pulpit. God wants the deacons to get on the streets and knock the doors and go out two by two to find the Ethiopian eunuchs sitting in their tra sitting in uh, sitting in the, the chariots, reading the word of God, searching for somebody, searching for something, and be a fill up and go and hear the Holy Spirit's beckon and its call to reach the lost. God's looking for somebody tonight to get a burden. God's looking for somebody tonight to be on His side and get a heartfelt burden for lost souls to reach the lost and dying world. God's looking for a church to be missions-minded, to want to rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity or sin in the grave. We for the erring ones. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Let's get out, stay busy, reaching people with the gospel of Christ. Anybody on God's side tonight, Anybody willing to get out and dirty your shoes a little bit and tell a lost and dying world before they die and spend eternity in a place called hell and their blood be on our hands? Hutchinson and Wichita are dying fast. Every three seconds somebody dies is what's been said. Are we going to be like Jonah? Run away from the call and over 300,000 people die? By the time we get to Nineveh, may we go not three days late, but would we get there on time to be a witness for God? The gospel still works. We just have to work the gospel. Amen? The gospel still works in people's lives. We just got to be the ones to get out and work the gospel. 
Tell people about Jesus. Tell the co-workers. Tell the lost person on the street. Tell the person behind the counter. Give a gospel tract to that, to that person that hands you the food through the drive-thru. Give the gospel tract at the place where you pay your bill or in, the, or in the envelope. Whatever you can do to get the gospel out because the gospel is the only thing that's going to save America tonight. God needs men and women on His team. God needs the pastors. God needs the layman. God needs the evangelist. God needs the bus workers. God needs the janitors. God needs the deacons. God needs the church members. God needs the singles. God needs the widowed. God needs the elderly. God needs the young. God needs the children. God needs the married. God needs everybody tonight. God needs a team of people that will charge hell with a squirt gun and a Bible and fight for souls. Are you on God's team tonight? Moses puts out a cry. Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Verse 27, And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord peradventure. I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Would America tonight we get back to realizing that there's a great sin in our land. It's a great sin that we've turned away from God. It's a great sin that we've not been on God's side, that we've been dancing with the devil. It's a great sin that we've been in the music of the world. It's a great sin that we've been in the world's dress and in the world's fashion. It's a great sin that we've not been with God. And we've made ourselves gods of gold and excused us. Yet now, verse 32, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, not me, I pray thee out of thy book, which thou hast written. Boy, you see Moses, a man of God that's angry, but yet you see his love for people. You see his love for the children of Israel. His anger waxed hot only because he loved them so much and he hated to see what they did to God. But yet he held God's hand and then he told God, if you'll forgive them, but if not, you can blot me out of your book. When a man of God gets up and they preach, and when a pastor one day stands behind his pulpit, preaches the word of God, it may not be what we want to hear, but no, they do it in love because they want to see you make it for God. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Sad in America, we've made ourselves calves. And God's going to bring judgment. America's going to see when God brings her low that God's not playing around. God's not messing around. And we as Christians, we know better. And God's going to judge the lost. God's going to judge America. But we stand by and we partake. And we get on their side instead of God. Anybody on God's side tonight? Would there be somebody on the Lord's side that would heed God's warning? That would answer the call? And say, I'm on God's side tonight. I'm with God. I'm not going to stand by and let the devil gain ground in my life. I'm going to be with God. I'm not going to let the devil gain ground in my family. I'm on God's side tonight. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to serve God. 
I'm going to give God my life. There's a great calling in your life today, and God wants you to get on his side and get on his team because God's got a great goal he wants done. Are you on God's side tonight? God needs somebody. God puts a call out. Will somebody help? Will somebody serve? He said, I searched for a man to fill the gap, and he found none. But Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. Send me. Somebody today in America's Baptist fundamental independent churches has got to stand up and say, God, here am I. I'm on your side. I'm going to be on your side tonight, God. God wants to speak to you. I love chapter 33, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. You see, Moses, when he put a call out, who's on God's side? There was a young man named Joshua. A young man named Joshua that was watching, that had a desire and a burn in his heart and a burn in his mind and a burn in his soul that he wanted to serve God, that he was on the Lord's side. And God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. Moses had a walk with God like nobody else he'd ever seen. And he turned again out of the camp. But Joshua, his servant, stayed back and stayed in the tabernacle. And I imagine the Bible doesn't say, but he probably cried out to God and said, God, I want to get to know you like Moses. I want to be on your side. I want to speak to you as a man does to a friend. I want to know what it is to walk with you. In America's churches, we need somebody tonight to want to get to know God like a Moses did. To want to get to know God face to face as a man did with his friend that wants to be on God's side, that has a desire and a burn to live for God and to serve God and to reach a lost and dying world. God needs women that want to serve God and lead their families and point their children to Jesus and not get out of the tabernacle but spend time with God face to face in their home and allow God to use them to point their children to Jesus Christ. God needs men that will stand up and say, I'm going to get out of the world. I'm tired of the sin. I'm tired of the world. I'm tired of maybe what God knows that we ought to get rid of. And I'm going to be on God's side. I'm going to be like Joshua. I've seen how God used evangelists. I've seen how God used great preachers. And I want to be used of God. Boy, God wants a servant named Joshua tonight to volunteer That'll not depart out of the tabernacle, but that'll want to get to know God like Moses did. Because God needs the leaders for the next generation. God needs the leaders in our churches. God needs the men to lead. God needs the women to stand up and lead for their families and stand up and lead for the younger women. God needs the men to lead on and be so winners and love God and lead their families. Sad though, we've departed out of the tabernacle. In America, we've departed out of the tabernacle to watch a stadium. We've departed out of the house of God. There's not church on Sunday night because there's a football game. There's not church on Wednesday night because it's inconvenient. America's churches have departed out of the tabernacle But would to God we get back to it. Anybody on God's side tonight? Want to be used of God? God puts out a call. God needs us tonight. There's a lost and dying world. God needs us to reach. But we can't reach it if we're backsliding. We can't reach it if we don't get on God's side. Maybe you're on God's side tonight. And I would assume most are. But if we're on God's side tonight, then may we rededicate our lives to reaching people with the gospel. I love verse 14 there in chapter 33. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, Carry us, not up hence. 
Boy, it ought to be our cry in America's churches that if God's presence doesn't go with us, that we won't go. If God, and we cry to God and say, God, we need your presence in our churches. We need your presence in our families. We need your presence in our lives. We're on God's side, but we need your presence. Because if we don't have his presence in our churches, then we've gathered in vain. If we don't have God's presence in our soul winning, then we go in vain. But God says, my presence shall go with thee. So we need to cry to God and say, God, we need your presence. You promised you'd give it to us. You promised you'd go with us. You promised you wouldn't leave us. Get God's presence tonight in your family. Get God's presence tonight in this church. Get God's presence in your life and allow God to fill you and go with you and watch you reach a lost and dying world. Watch you reach your families for God. Watch you reach your potential and serve God in a way you've never known before. We need God's presence tonight in America. We've got the presence of everything else. We've got the presence of the devil all over. The devil's presence is even in our homes. But would God tonight we play clean up and give God a place to live. Give God a presence in our lives. Give God a place to use. Is God's presence with you tonight? He indwells you. Like I said this morning in Sunday school, there's a difference with God being in you and God filling your life. God's presence wants to fill. God's presence wants to be everywhere you go. When you walk into work, when you walk into the store, God's presence wants to be so well known that when you walk down, people look and say, who is that guy? Who is that woman? There's something strange about them. They've got a smile on. They've got a skirt on. They look like a Christian. They look like that Jesus guy. They must be a Jesus freak. Well, you know what? Yes, I'm a freak for Jesus, amen. But I want God's presence to go with me that I can be a light to a lost and dark world. Anybody on God's side tonight? Anybody want to get in with God? If we do, in verse 16 in chapter 33, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So, well, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. You're going to be on God's side tonight. We're going to have to be separated. We're going to have to be different from the people of this world. We're going to have to have a different look, a different attitude, a different music, a different beat. We walk to a different step. It's been said by a great preacher that when I got saved, God jerked my heart so hard towards heaven that I've been out of step with this world ever since. And would it be that we'd be different people from both anybody upon the face of the earth? Verse 17, the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Do you, does God know you by name tonight? Or are you a stranger? Does God know you by name tonight? Yes, God knows our name. But like a child and the father, there has to be a relationship. Could God call you by name and you recognize the call? Or would it be a strange voice that God beckons? How do I know? How do we get to know God that well? It's by a walk with God. Did you pray today? Have you gotten a hold of God? I'm not talking about for your food. I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I'm talking about you got down on your knees with a small prayer list in front of you and ask God to make you a better soul winner and ask God to fill the church and ask God to bring the right man and ask God to use you in a daily walk with Him. I love the cry that Moses gives and he said, I beseech thee in verse 18, show me thy glory. Moses said, God, I beg you. I beg you, God. Show me your glory. He said, I beg you, God, would you show me what you can do? I beg you, God, would you use a man that can barely talk? Would you use a man that's shy? Would you use a man that's a sinner, that's murdered, that's done 
sin. Would you use a man that's come out of Egypt? He said, I beg you, God, show me your glory. Would there be somebody tonight that would go home and say, God, I beg you, show me your glory. I beg you, God, show me what you can do with me. I beg you, God, show me what you can do through an old, filthy, rotten sinner that's an unworthy vessel. God wants to see somebody tonight that's desperate to get to know Him. That's desperate to show His glory through them. Do you want God's glory tonight? Because if you do, verse 19, And He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Verse 20, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. You see, Moses was talking with God. He begged God to see his glory. And God said, you can't see all of it, for no man see me and live. But you can see part of it. God wants to show you his glory tonight. God wants to show you his glory in your life. God wants to show you what he can do. And God will show you. And when you come down off that mountain, like Moses did, your face will be glowing. Your face will be bright. And somebody will look at you and say, who on earth is that guy? Look at that man's face. He's been with God. Boy, it'll change your life when you get to know God this way. When God shows you His glory. And you get up off your face in prayer and you begged God for His glory and you watch God do something and you watch God fill the church and you watch God lead souls to you that want to know about heaven and they bow their head and trust Christ as their Savior. But somebody's got to be on God's side tonight. It starts back in chapter 32 where somebody draws a line, makes a decision to be on God's side and then they come to verse 33 and beg God to know His glory. And watch God fill your life with the Holy Spirit of God and use you in a great way. Anybody on God's side tonight? God wants to show. God wants to reach people. I love how God says, He said, I will. God didn't say He might show us His glory. God says, I will. If we do our part, and we beg God, and we get on God's side, and we give God a vessel to use, then God says, I will. Boy, I want to be that vessel. Boy, I want to know what it's like to beg God and ask God to fill and show me His glory and watch God use me to reach people. Watch God use me to give the gospel. We have a decision to make tonight. Are you on God's side? If not, can I draw a line at the altar and ask you to get on God's side? Ask you to come forward, make a decision to be on God's side tonight. Maybe you are, but there's a few areas we need to get back on God's side. You've let the devil gain ground. Maybe you've given in. Time we take it back. We tell the old serpent that you can't have it. We're on God's side. And would somebody tonight beg to see God's glory? Beg to see God use them? Because God will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Lord, would you...